Hello, and welcome to the IME 143, 144, and 145 Mill Project One CAD CAM Programming Virtual Lab. Today, I'm gonna to take you through the steps required to make the G code for the CNC Mill Project Number One for the IME Club, Freshman Manufacturing Courses. So first off, I kinda of wanna talk a little bit about CNC programming workflow and how we go from a CAD model to a CNC machine part here. First, you got to start off with your CAD model. You need some sort of geometry that's going to describe the part that you're manufacturing. So you either have your SolidWorks, your Fusion 360 model, your Inventor, whatever CAD system you use, you have some sort of model. It doesn't matter which CAD system you use as long as the model describes the geometry of your part perfectly. Now, once you, once you have your CAD model, you've got to start figuring out where some of the parameters are going to be located on that model, such as the work coordinate system. Remember, the work coordinate system is also known as a G54 in the, in the G code in the Haas. That's what locates it. And that work coordinate system is your X, Y, Z, zero point for that part. So remember, everything's based off the right-hand rule for the axes when you go like this with your hand, right? So we have positive X, positive Y, and positive Z with, with our right hand there. So your thumb is your positive X direction, your pointer finger is your positive Y direction, and your middle finger is your positive Z. So you've got to figure out where you want to put that zero point on your part. And that point has to be repeatable. I have to be able to load and unload parts from the CNC machine and have that X, Y, Z zero point never change. So it's got to be a fixed position on the CNC machine on the fixture somewhere. And so I'm able to load parts in and out every single time and not have that, that zero point or the work coordinate system ever change. So that's really what the manufacturing engineer needs to do when they, when they first get a part, is determine what fixturing they're gonna to use to hold onto the part or work holding and where you're gonna put that zero point on the, that, that coordinate system or that work coordinate system. Now, part of that, for that understanding where the work coordinate system is gonna go is knowing your stock shape and size as well. So I've got to know, am I going to use bar stock? Am I starting off with a casting, a forging, a custom shaped extrusion? Because that part of that figuring out where that coordinate system is going to go and that with that work holding is once you know how it's being held in the work holding and where the fixed point is, you then, and what the stock looks like, you can then establish that work coordinate system. So really got to know your stock size and where the zero point is going to be. After that, you got to look at that engineering drawing and knowing how much material you have on your raw stock to remove, you've got to select the different machining processes or the different tool paths required to remove that material. And we're going to do a little bit of that today. We're going to do all of that today. So we'll go through and we'll talk about the different types of tool paths there are and, and how, they, how they're different between each other, like pocket versus contour, drilling, and so forth. So we'll, we'll select some machining processes. Along with those tool paths or those machining processes, we have cutting tools. So the cutting tools have machining parameters such as feeds and speeds. So based off the workpiece and my cutting tool material, I've got to select a surface speed and a chip load to go ahead and use for that tool. So I now know how fast it's gonna spin and how fast it's gonna move around the machine. So speed and feed. And once it's got that speed and feed value, I've also got to tell it it's depth of cut, it's width of cut and pretty much where it's gonna cut on the part. I'm able to tell the CAM system where it's gonna cut on the part by selecting what we call driving CAD geometry. So I'll select surfaces or edges that act as my boundary points and drive the tool, the tool, the tool's location in respect to that workpiece. Once I've created all my tooling or my tool paths, I'm gonna go and verify these tool paths through a virtual simulation. So I can virtually simulate and machine material virtually to see if I have a bad depth of cut or if I have you know, too much step over. Of course, it's not gonna tell you if the tool is gonna break because no matter what, it's gonna virtually simulate what the tool does. So this kind of gets you a good idea if you're taking off too much material and it takes some time to understand how that, that actually works there. So that's gonna, be, well, that's gonna be everything we do pretty much in the computer system other than post-process. So the last step in CAD CAM programming is using something called a post processor. And that post processor is what actually creates the G and M code from the tool paths in the computer. And that, so that post processor, I'll post using a Haas post. 
and I end up then getting the code for my machine. At that point, I'm ready to transfer the G code to the machine, set up and operate that CNC machine to make the part. So we're gonna go through all these steps today in this virtual lab together. And hopefully that's gonna give you a better understanding of what manufacturing engineers do in order to create programs, CNC programs for, for parts. Now, in CAD CAM programming, there's really three major components of CAD CAM programming. There's computer aided design, the CAD part. So that's when you create your models and your geometry that you want to machine. So then there's the CAM side of the software, which that's basically creating all the tool paths and writing the GNM code for the machine tools. So the CAM software generates what we call centerline location data in reference to the work coordinate system and the edges of your part. So it figures out where the center line of that tool needs to go based off the tool size where the coordinate system is. And it generates basically cutter paths. It hasn't generated G code in, in the, at this point. The last point or the post processor is what actually generates the code. So the post processor looks at all the data from the CAD portion of the CAD CAM program and the CAM portion, and it figures out when to go ahead and make it a G1, which is a linear feed rate versus like a wrap at a G00 and so forth. So it makes, it takes all that data and makes a usable CNC program that the control can read. So to do this, let's jump into SolidWorks and I'm gonna show you how we programmed a mill project one from start to finish. Now I gotta swap my screen share. So I'm not coming back to this, this PowerPoint. So we'll go here. So. Before I, before I actually talk about, uh, before I jump into the CAD system, this is the part we're making here. This is mill project number one. And this part was designed to show you, uh, or to show engineer, young engineers, how different features are manufactured on parts. So really this part has got a lot of common features out there that you would see on other machined parts, such as I have a contour around the outside of the part. So that'll be a contour, we'll talk about that. It's, doesn't have a nominal thickness right here, right? It's got like 0.48. So I have to use face mills to go ahead and get it down to the right height or thickness. It's got a little GD and T. We'll talk about that when we get to that point. But um, so it's got a face mill pass. It's got contour passes. It's got a pocket. So you'll see right here, we've got a pocket that's an eighth inch deep. Um, it's also got some holes, some of the standard holes that you would see out there. It's got a through hole, the 0.2 through hole here. It's got what we call a blind hole, one that doesn't go all the way through the 0.38 depth for the blind hole. It's got a counterboard hole, right? A bore within a bore is what we call a counterbore. It's got a counter sunk hole, and then it's got a threaded hole. So it's got all the major types of holes. And of course, so we don't cut ourselves on the part, it's got a chamfer. And last but not least, what I didn't mention, it's got a ball end mill to cut this fillet in the part right here. So we're gonna cut this full 180 degree radius with a ball end mill. Now, those are the major features. And based off the features, you actually have to select the different cutting tools. So uh, we pick our end mills based off of the radius of the part, right? So if I have to make a radius on the inside of this part for this pocket, the radius is 0.325. So if I double that, 0.650 is the largest diameter end mill I could ever use to make this part but it's not good to have the same size diameter end mill as your radius in your, in your part. You like to do a circular interpolation to interplate around the corner. And it, so what we do is we use smaller tools. We'll end up using a three eighths tool to go ahead and finish that out. Half inch to, to rough and then three eighths to finish there. Now, looking at some of the other parts here, it's only 1.875 wide. So to face mill this thing, we'll end up probably using a two inch diameter face mill to go ahead and cover the entire part. Now, looking at the radius on the part, that's one thing I forgot to dimension right here. This is an eighth inch radius. So we're gonna use a quarter inch ball end mill to cut that. And the drills, we would have to go to a drill and tap chart to go ahead and look up the diameter of a 0.257 drill, just a drill chart. We don't need the tap size, but that 257 diameter ends up being what we call an F drill. That's the size of it. So we'll use an F drill to drill these 257 diameter holes. And we'll then use an end mill to make the counter bore. And we'll end up using a counter sink to make the counter sink. It's a tool that's got the angle built into it. And quite honestly, I'm making a 40, I'm gonna make a 90 degree counter sink on the part 
because we have the same tool that's gonna make the chamfer, the countersink, as we do the, the countersink on the part right here. So I didn't wanna have one extra tool just to make a countersink. So this value right here, this 82 degree, doesn't match our tooling. We have a 90 degree countersink. And again, that's only eight degrees off. It won't fit in the standard hardware, but we're not too worried about that. So it would take a full extra tool to go ahead and make this 82 degree countersink that's why we're making the countersink at a 90 degree at a 90 degree angle. Now, that's the major tooling. And of course, we're gonna have a number seven jobber drill and a tap for this quarter 20 hole. We'll have a CNC spiral flute tap. But pretty much that's all the tooling required to make this part. We need our face mills to face it to the right height. We need our end mills to pocket and contour the part. We need our ball end mill to put the full fillet in it. We need our spot drill to go ahead and spot the holes. We need a regular drill or regular jobber drills to come out and make the holes. Then we need the tap to make the thread. We need the, we're gonna bring back out the spot drill, the 90 degree spot drill to make the, a 90 degree countersink and then the chamfers. So that's literally the, the tooling we need for this part. That's, that's a skill set a manufacturing engineer should start to develop is to be able to look at a part and realize what size cutting tools do I need to manufacture this part. So now another thing you've got to do is you got to figure out what stock size am I going to start off with, right? So looking at this part right here, I look at the overall dimensions. I see that I've got 1.875 right here for the overall the front view, so the overall height. Then the width is 4.0. And then the thickness right here is 0.48. So they don't make stock sizes in non-nominal values. They make them in fractional sizes. So what we're gonna end up doing here is we're gonna end up cutting or we're going to end up ordering two inch stock because they don't make, they might make a 1875, they, they might. But the chances are you're gonna normally find stock sizes in quarter inch increments. So you can get like, you can get like quarter inch thick by, two inch wide and so forth. So if we take our, if we take that quarter inch increment rule and apply it to this part, I would say that the next rounding, rounding up would be two inches for this stock. If this is four overall, let's not make a four inch piece of stock. Let's order it by half inch. So if I order it two inch by half inch and I order an extrusion with that cross-sectional area, so two inches, by half inch cross-sectional area extrusion, I can go ahead and put it on the saw and cut it to like a 4.1 length of cut right there. And that's gonna be the, the most preferred uh, size of stock to order because we wanna grab it in the vise on the extruded edges. We would never wanna grab the part on saw cut edges in the vise because chances are they're not very parallel. And when the cutting tools come around and start shearing chips off the workpiece, it might kick the tool actually out of the vise, or it might kick the part out of the vise because you don't have parallel sides. So you always try to hold on extruded sides for your stock if you're using an extrusion. You don't want to hold on the saw cut sides. So that's what made me go with the two inch stock instead of a four inch stock. Plus the final part is four inches. So if I, I'd have to really order four and a quarter because I couldn't trust that four would actually clean it up to that plus or minus five thou. So long story short, we are going to basically use, let me come over to this drawing. We're going to use 0.5 thick stock by two inches wide, and we're going to cut it to a 4.1 length of cut. At that point, we are going to manufacture operation number one to qualify the surfaces or the datums on the part. So when I go back to this drawing right here, I see that I have an A datum on the bottom of my part. Then I have a parallelism call out to the A datum on the second side of it. So when I see datums, my goal is to qualify the datums as soon as possible when machining. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to basically start cutting this part out upside down technically in op one. I'm going to qualify that A datum with a two inch face mill pass. So we're going to just take 10 thou. We're going to go ahead and go from 0.5 to 0.49. Take 10 thou off the top, qualify that surface, that A datum. And then we're going to come and contour around this outside profile of the part, the four by 1.875. That qualifies two other surfaces to locate off in op two. 
I won't be accurate if I lo don't locate off machine surfaces after the first CNC operation for my work coordinate system. So my work coordinate system must be based off machine surfaces after, you, after that first CNC operation there. So I'm trying to qualify at least three mutually perpendicular surfaces to go ahead and locate off of later on in, in the operation. So moving back up here, this is gonna be what op one looks like afterwards. What we're doing here is we're taking that 4.1 length of cut by the two inch stock, and we're gonna face mill it down to the 0.49 we're then gonna profile around the part or contour around the part with an end mill. And we're gonna make this 1.875 by 4.0 machined profile, which is actually the bottom of the part. Because if you look at this dimension right here, the 0 0.30 down, if I go back here, you're gonna see that the thickness of the part really is basically 0 .2, 0 0.28, right? over here that distance. So as long as I go in op one and I go 0 0.30 down, I'll flip it around. I'll get rid of whatever I held onto with in the second operation right there. So literally I'm going to just face, contour, and basically chamfer on my first CNC operation right here. Fair enough, everybody. So let's go ahead and jump into SolidWorks real quick. I got to change my screen share. So this is, this is our part in SolidWorks. Let me go back. Let me go over here to our configurations. The way it works, I'm going to show this configuration here in SolidWorks. So what I have, I'm going to hide this line too. We're going to use that later. So what I have is I have the CAD geometry of my final part, right? This is normally all you're given. When you need to make a part as an engineer, you're given the final part. And your first, your first thing that you really need to do is study the dimensions on the, on the part and the tolerances. Now, sometimes there's a model-based definition. So the, you can actually put the tolerances and define all of the GD and T and tolerances directly on your drawings or on your solid model instead of having an engineering drawing. So if you have model-based definitions, you should study all the critical tolerances on that solid model right there. Now, that, not all the industries there. So the first that what we would do is we would study our engineering drawings. because That's what we have in this class. And from that engineering drawing, we look at all of the tight tolerances and what we've got to go ahead and achieve on this part here. So after that's done, and we've, we've picked all of, all of our tooling, kind of talked about that. I want to start setting up basically but the way my part is going to look, I'm gonna press save real quick, by the way. So I'm gonna set up the way my part's gonna look through the different operations. So to do that, I made op one configuration and op two configuration in SolidWorks. So in SolidWorks, I really have only three different parts right here. I have this one right here. Well, let me go to the default configuration actually, which I'm in, I just wanted to make sure. I have this part right here, which you can see. Then I also have the workpiece blank. Give me one second there and get off that there. I have the workpiece blank, which I'm going to unsuppress. And then I'm going to show. So that's my raw material, by the way. So you'll see that. That's my blank. I'm going to hide. Now I also have, if I unsuppress it, there's my op one and I have that basically, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hide this one real quick. There's what my op one is gonna look like and it happens to be transparent. So real quick, I'm gonna change transparency. So there's my, what, what my goal is for op one. When I'm done cutting, I sh my other part fits right in there. And if I change the transparency here, hopefully you can see this is how we're gonna make the part. So in op one, we're going down about 20 thou deeper than we need to go, which is gonna go ahead and give me this surface to locate off of, and then we'll get rid of all this extra material in op two later on. So what I've done is instead of having to switch back and forth right here, I've created what we call configurations. So what I can do is I can show the configuration 
So I'm not going to regenerate. It's just asking me, do I want to regenerate my model, right? My cam stuff, and I don't right now. But my configuration, if I look at it, right click, change transparency, this is going to be what I'm cutting right here. So I have my for op one. So basically, I have a, an assembly configuration with my raw material there. If I was to go space bar, whoops, not that way, here and look at it real closely, you'll see my stock is about 10 thou above the surface of my part, right? So you can see that. So my stock is slightly higher than my final machine part in there. So I have basically two models in this assembly. One I'm gonna use for the stock, the other one I'm gonna to use to go ahead and show the CAM system what profiles I wanna cut. So at this point, I'm ready. I've got my geometry all set up in SolidWorks to go ahead and start CAM programming. I've got my OP1 and my OP2 geometry. Now, if you are interested in getting this little CAM manager right here in HSM works in your own version of SolidWorks, you can get it for free as a student. So you got to, if you don't follow the specific instructions I'm going to tell you right now, you'll only get it for like a few months and then it'll, it'll time out and you'll have to reload it. But as a student, you can get all of the Autodesk software for free. So this is actually Autodesk software inside SolidWorks. So I got Dassault Systems that makes SolidWorks. I've got Autodesk that makes Inventor, Fusion 360, and a lot of other software. And they've made basically this plugin called uh, HSM Works for SolidWorks, which is a CAD CAM, which is a CAM program. And it gives me this CAM tab that you see right here. So if I was to go here to the internet real quick, let me grab that. I know you're not seeing it on my screen. Let me go to autodesk.com. Then I'm going to share it. So I'll go to new share. So if you sign in right here and you register or you register for an Autodesk account with your calpoly.edu, all the Autodesk software is free as long as you're a student using it for educational purposes. So you could download the HSM works and install it into and install it into your actual, I forgot my username and password right there, but install it into your actual SolidWorks and use it. That's also where you would download Fusion 360 if you're interested in learning that one or Inventor too. I believe they still have that up there. So again, autodesk.com and you can download this software. Some of you might want to stop the video right now, download the software and check it out. Try, try, along, try it out. Who knows? So when I then, once I've downloaded the software and I install it into my SolidWorks, I get this, what we call CAM tab. And remember, CAM stands for Computer Aided Manufacturing. So with this CAM tab, I can, I can go ahead and do everything I need to do in order to program that CNC machine, other than create the geometry, because I do that in the assembly or I do that in the part environment. Then I bring it all in and I, I like to program in assemblies so I can have my stock, my fixtures, everything pretty much right there in an assembly. And I know if I'm gonna crash into anything and so forth. So you're gonna see we have two CNC operations right here. Operation one and then operation two. Now operation number one, if you remember, we were going to basically take this part, we're gonna face mill it, we're gonna contour it and we're going to chamfer the part. Now, to do that, you're gonna see, I create what we call a setup, like you see right here. So with this setup here, I then have to specify, or it's known as a job, it's no, set up a job, same thing. So what I do is I'm gonna create, well, I'm gonna create this op one setup for you by, from scratch. So what I do is I do a job right here. What it is, is a job is one single operation in a CNC machine. So I'm gonna pull this up right here and you're gonna see here's my job parameters. So this job would be basically op number one. So op number one, basically demo. Now I've gotta show it the model that I wanna go ahead and program off of. Because I, I, I could go click on the model right here, or I could come up here in the design tree and know that I want to program off of CNC op one. So I click that model right there. Now I've got to give it stock size. So not only do I show it the CAD model I want to cut, 
I give it the stock size, which is going to be from solid. And my solid is my op one mill project one workpiece blank right there, the pink right there, right? The two inch by half inch by 4.1 length of cut of stock. Now I've got to basically tell the machine tool exactly where my home location is. Now your home location is known as your G54 or your work coordinate system. Now that work coordinate system has to be in a fixed location on the CNC machines fixture or work holding that never moves. Basically I put it in, it's a fixed location and it, I can never really move it. So what I wanna show you real quick is the setup sheet for operation number one here. So let me share this, let me share this. So this is another thing that manufacturing engineers do after they write their CNC programs. They create what we call a setup sheet to describe to the technician how to set up the machine tool. See, engineers get paid way too much to set up machine tools. So what we do is we, we create all of the technical side of things, make sure safety's involved and so forth, then it's gonna work correctly. Then we release all that, the, the, the technical engineering that we've done or the manufacturing engineering done to the technicians that then set up the parts and so forth. So we have to go ahead and create detailed setup sheets and instructions for every program we write so we can have a setup person go and set up the, a setup technician go set up the machine. So this is the setup sheet for CNC op number one right here. So what I've got is I've got a vice that moves right here. So the vice, if I go ahead and annotate real quick, the vice has a movable jaw. This one happens to be in the back. It's kind of rare. It's a chick vice. It's a, the reason we have them is I can change out my jaws repeatable within a thou. So I can swap lab projects without ever having to do any other setup right there. They're great vice. But on this chick vice, we have the front jaw is the fixed jaw. This jaw doesn't move. The back jaw goes back and forth when I, when I twist the vice handle to clamp the workpiece. Now within this, this vice right here, remember it's a three, two, one locate, locate, locator system. So when I have my primary plane or that vice, the bottom of the vice, it's three right there. Three points make a plane, sit at level to the, the plane, the top plane on the CNC machine that, that constrains three degrees of freedom. The next thing is the front jaw, right? The front jaw touches at least in two points right here and constrains two more degrees of freedom, which only allows the part to slide back and forth in one degree of freedom. Now, if you look, the tertiary or the stop, there's a little pin right here, the, the little black pin. That black pin it basically acts as the tertiary stop or the datum stop. So you butt your stock up against that pin and I have the common saying X, Y, Z, zero in the bottom left corner of my part. So based off the right hand rule, that's the Z, that's the Y positive, and that's the X positive right there. So I, now that I know how it works in my machine, I have to make it set up correctly in my CAD system. So I'm gonna clear that real quick, or my CAM system, CAD CAM system saying, you understand. So moving over to the back to SOLIDWORKS, share that. In order to set my work coordinate system, I'm gonna go off my stock and basically orientation. So I pick the top face to orient the Z up. The X is pointing to the right. This is good so far. The Y is pointing back. I need to be able to put my home location in this bottom corner of the stock. Well, right now it's at top center. I'm gonna guess bottom corner three and I was wrong. So it's gonna be bottom corner maybe, or is it bottom corner two? No, bottom corner four. It's probably in my fourth one, right? Bottom corner four oh, is the last one. So we got bottom corner one. So we, I'm gonna pick bottom corner one right here. So this represents the, where the stop is in my work coordinate system for my stock. And that's gonna be known as the G54 in the Haas mill right there. So that's gonna be, be right there, we're set up. And 
If I want to go ahead and just post with the, that G54, I could do one, a zero. One will post G55 and so forth. And my program name is a five digit number. So I'm just gonna go one, two, three, four, one. So it's gonna be program number one. And I'm gonna write mill project number one, op number one. So what it'll do is it'll name my, it'll put that as a comment and name my program when I post. So literally let's review the job. I pick the type of, the type of machining I'm doing, milling or turning. I pick the comment that I want, op one demo. I pick the model that I'm cutting off of. I pick the I pick the stock size right there, which was my model. I pick bottom corner one right here for my work coordinate system. I'm not really worried about the machine right here because I could do a model of the machine. But then I pick my my program number, my CNC program number, and any comments that I have right there. So when I hit check mark you're gonna see it just created this job. I'm gonna drag it down, drag it up there, just so I'm working on that one. And now, because I wanna rename it, just so it makes sense to me, I'm gonna right click. I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to rename. I'm gonna call it op number one demo. There we go. So that's our op number one demo part. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead I'm going to go save. I also kind of want to do file save as just in case, because I'm going to be messing with some stuff. And I usually do that when, when I mess with stuff. So assembly W21 for winter 21. Cool. So at this point, now I've got my op one demo. When I click on it, it shows me my stock in yellow and my part kind of in gray and where my work coordinate system is. So I'm pretty much ready to go ahead and start cutting. Now there's this tool library right here. So when I click on that tool library, I have already gone through and set up all of my tools that I use for this part. So like the half inch flat, the three eighths flat, the, the quarter inch ball, we're gonna use a five eighths 90 degree spot drill. We're gonna use a 1 16th inch ball end mill to engrave. I forgot to mention that in the tooling. We use, I use ball end, small ball end mills to engrave. We'll use the 201 drill to drill the two, the 0 0.20 hole and that and then that drill for the tapped hole. We'll use the 257 drill to drill the two through holes. We'll tap with a with a CNC tap and then we'll and we'll face mill. So I basically got all 10 tools set up. But how that actually works is I like to set up my tools before I program just so I can then start programming. And how you would set them up is you would go right here to new mill tool. And what that does is on that new mill tool, you're going to see that on that new mill tool, make sure, I was just making sure you saw the, I'm gonna go right here just to make sure you can see everything, screen one, share. So I'm not sure based off my screen share if you're able to see this, but it's the, let me go back and redo this. So it's the tool library, half inch flat, three eighths inch flat. So it basically you can build all of your tools with your feeds and speeds in here before you ever start programming. What I wanna do is I wanna go ahead and I want to, make sure that's still working. I wanna go ahead and build a new mill tool for you. I'm gonna do this once, but realize I went through and built all these tools with the correct surface speeds and chip loads in order to get the right speed and feed out of it. Now, when I go to new mill tool, this will be my number. I'm gonna pick number 12 because I know we don't have a tool 12. So that's my tool 12, my length offset 12, and my diameter 12. So it'll be tool number 12 if we had that many positions in our carousel. We only have 10 in, in our lab on our mini mills. So that's why, that's why we have to share some of the tools and make the wrong size countersink. Now, when I go to my cutter here, all the cutters we learned about in class thus far, the flat end mill, the ball end mill, the bull nose end mill, there's a tapered end mill. Remember that was a form cutter that I talked about. There's a dovetail mill, the reverse chamfer. There's the lollipop, which is used for head porting. Don't worry about that one, but you can go around the full surface of it. It's used for CNC head porting a lot, other stuff too. But it gets a relief under the back. But there's a lollipop mill. It's another type of form tool. There's a chamfer mill. That's your chamfer tool, 45 degrees. 
There is a radius mill to do the corner radius. I showed you pictures of that in your, le in your lecture slides. There's a face mill for face milling. There's a basically what we call a slot mill or what we call key cutters. We're gonna use the key cutter in the, in the CNC, next CNC project, the virtual screwdriver project. We'll cut a key cutter for a thread relief. There's, a, there's basically a drill. We learned about drills. There's four sizes of them. We've learned about center drills to basically create a 60 degree conical hole for a center to start a drill bit. There's spot drills, which also spot a hole. Then there's, there's taps, right hand and left handed taps. There's countersinks, which a countersink will make a countersunk hole, it doesn't cut in the center. The, the, or they do cut in the center, sorry. Counter bore, to make, there's special tools to make counter bores if you don't use an end mill. And then there's reamers to make a tight tolerance, good form hole for a press fit. There's boring bars, which uses a single point cutting tool to enlarge a hole. Then last but not least, there's a form mill that you can import your own form tool in there. So you could design your own form tool and bring it in as a CAD file and use it as a tool to cut your part. But, and then last but not least, there's a probe and then thread milling. So all those tools or we've learned about them in, in class thus far. Every single one of those, I guarantee we've talked about. So I'm gonna go back up here. I'm just gonna build a flat mill right here just to show you how this works. Now, the flat end mill has a diameter. That's one of the most important things for programming. I'm gonna make basically a quarter inch diameter tool right here, 0.25. And the flute length is its length of cut shoulder length so you build your tool exactly like you would have it in the machine so it knows to it will give you a warning if you go deeper than the flutes or if you rub it up on the holder up here and so forth so you can build the shaft exactly like your tool here so you have your cutter and then the shaft for the tool you build it exactly like it is in the machine you get your caliper out and you measure it now when you're doing advanced stuff you sometimes bring in what we call the tool holder Remember what holds a cutting tool, a tool holder. And now I can go ahead, I could, whoops, I could go ahead and I could grab, I could basically describe a holder here and I could build basically a tool holder right there to look just like my tool holder to make sure it, it doesn't crash into my workpiece. Now, the most important things really is the cutter geometry here and then this feed and speed chart. So if you remember, we use surface speed to calculate RPM. So if I ran like a 500 surface speed for this tool, I, for a quarter inch tool, I'd be running a 7639 RPM. Remember that's that 12 times the cutting speed divided by pi times diameter. It's taking that surface speed, which is a linear velocity and calculating it into a rotational velocity. Remember it's the linear velocity at the tool and the workpiece's tangential edge where they touch. So I have a spindle speed for when I'm cutting. I also have one for when I'm plunging down into a part. Sometimes you slow down a little bit when you plunge down into a part. Then, so that's your speed. Your feed is gonna be based off the number of flutes or teeth that that cutter has. So if I had like a three flute cutter for aluminum and I was gonna run basically a three thou chip load, I would be running 68.75 inches per minute. Now what I do in all my programs, if I see that 68.7, I'll round up to like 69 inches a minute. And so I don't like weird decimal numbers afterwards because if you think about it, an inch in a minute isn't very far, or very big of a change, very big change, but too much of this, you might break the tool because of too big of a chip load. So you use the recommended surface speed and the recommended chip load that the cutting tool manufacturer gives you for their cutting tool. And then you put those variables in here. Now, when you're going down in depth, it's called a plunge. When you're dropping down in depth, you usually plunge at about half to two thirds the speed, depending on what you're doing. So I'm gonna just make that 30, 34 for right now. So that's what I can do in my head at the moment, 34 and a half. So when I press okay, that gives me a tool to actually use right there. So that's what the tool library is all about. So it's right up here, I hit tool library, I build cutting tools that I'm gonna use. Now, for the, for the part. Now, because I already have all my tools in the tool library, I'm basically gonna show you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this real quick. I'm gonna generate all the tool paths to show you. 
So I'm going to go through and show you how to create these blue lines, yellow and red lines and green. Those are all the tool paths. What they do is they represent the center line cutter data, the center line location for that cutter. So basically we're creating, when we create these tool paths, we're creating cutter location data for the center line of, of the part right there. So to do this, perfect. I was just looking at them. So now we're gonna go in here. Now, because we have our job already all set up, we come right over here to this 2D milling. And these are the two, everything we did in this class for this for is 2D milling. When you get into the more advanced classes in IME 146, we'll talk about three axis and 3D milling when we make our Geneva wheel. And then if you're in the IME 144 series of classes, you're going to, you're going to basically not get exposed to that unless you're a manufacturing engineer or you're interested in CNC machining. You'll then get to, get to see that in uh, IME 335 and 336. And then also IME 450 when we make molds and so forth. But we're gonna pretty much focus on 2D milling tool paths today or two and a half axis machining. What I mean by two and a half axis machining, I drop the Z down and then I only move the X, Y axis simultaneously. So really I'm doing two axis simultaneous and then the half of the axis is my depth of cut. When I'm talking 3D milling or three axis tool paths, I move X, Y, and Z all in one line of code or one move to follow a surface. A lot of parts can get done with just 2D milling tool paths. Now, within these 2D milling tool paths, I have face, I have adaptive clearing, I have 2D pocket, I have 2D contour, slot, thread. I can do a circular, circular pass. I can do a bore or I could do a trace which follows kind of 3D a little bit, and then 2D chamfer and then engrave. So I'm gonna show you today, I'm gonna to show you face, I'm gonna show you 2D contour, uh, at least on this op one, and then 2D chamfer. When we get to op two, I'll show you how the, I'll show you basically how the adaptive works, which is pretty cool, it's just really cool. I'll show you how the adaptive stuff works and some of the advanced stuff there. So I'm going to I'm going to fully program op one for you all the way through. And then I don't think you would we'd be here for the full three hours of lab if I did op two and then went to into the actual project. So um, and I, I talked about every little detail in op two. So I'm going to basically cover op one completely. And then we're going to look through op two on how we actually did op two. That'll give you enough knowledge and CAD CAM programming to get your hands dirty if you're interested in this type of stuff. And you can always stop by office hours, ask questions, my office hours, or you can go ahead and shoot me an email as well. So for operation number one, let me close this one, come back down here. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to 2D milling, I'm gonna pick face. Remember what facing does is it, it makes the surface 90 degrees to the axis of the rotating cutter. Face mills are non-center cutting, so they start off the part, they come across the part, and they, overall, they take the overall height down somehow. So when I'm doing this facing right here, you're gonna see I have, I created the, the tool, I'm creating the tool path here. So to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and first pick my tool. So there's, once you pick your tool path up here, like face, you have five tabs to fill out right here in order to make the tool path. The first tab right here is all about your tool. So when I go to library, I go pick my face mill, my two inch face mill, and I hit select. So what that does is it builds a two inch, it puts a, the, the body of the tool there. I made it way longer than it should be. So if I was to go to library, double click on this technically, right? I could go ahead to my cutter and the flute length is really like 0.25. The body length is more like three. Hold on, the shoulder length is more like one. The shaft diameter is two. The overall length is not 14, it's like five. There we go. So that looks a little bit better. Three is still a little bit long, we'll go to two. Sound good, and then we press okay, yes. So all I did there was I just changed the size of my simulation circle that represents my tool, just because it was kind of annoying having it so large. So I literally, here, take my surface speed, which is 1500 for these inserts, and basically put it in, it calculates the RPM right there. 
I then give it a chip load and it calculates the feed rate like you see right here. So the surface speed for the face mill, you may need to know this, is 1500 feet per minute for this, for this first one that we're cutting at, which is gonna be at 2,864 RPM. Now, the chip load for the face mill that we're cutting at is 0 0.00296. So let's go ahead and just call that basically three thou real quick. We're gonna do three thou for the chip load and just realize that's 34.3 inches per minute. On the real program, I just rounded it down to 34 because I like whole numbers. But the answer for the chip load would be three thou. Sound good, everybody? Now, at this point, when I come over here, I select my geometry, my stock contours. It, it used my stock because it knows you're usually, you see it's in orange. It knows that you're usually face milling your entire piece of stock. So I can pick the, it automatically picks the entire piece of stock. Or I could hit stock contours and then select exactly where I wanted to face. If I only wanted to face, um, oops, I don't, don't want to do that one. If I only wanted to face maybe just the, the top surface there, it would look at that geometry only. But that's not what I want. I want the entire part right here. So this is the second tab's all about picking the CAD geometry that you're driving surfaces for your tool paths. This next tab is all about your heights. It's how high do you want to go? Yeah, basically for your retract. So when you pull out, how, how high do you want to go? Where do you want to go ahead? And your clearance is where it's going to go ahead and wrap it down to before it starts feeding down. So I like to do all mine off stock top when I'm first cutting, right? So if you think about it, we're going to start 0.1 from the stock top. We're going to retract 0.1 to the stock top, same points. We're going to start feeding 0.1 from the stock top. Now the top of my cut, this top is the top of your cut, that's gonna be zero from the stock top. And then the bottom of my cut is either zero from my model top or from my stock top, it's negative 10,000, it's the same thing. So, or I could just hit from selection and pick the top of my part right there. That's the same thing as well. So what it's doing, it's going between these two planes right here. So you can, can see it's going between this top planes where it's gonna start cutting, this bottom planes where it's gonna stop cutting right there. That's literally my, my part right there. So if I go ahead and I go to my next tab, I can go ahead and give it my step over. So this is my width of cut, my step over. If I make it bigger than my part, like 2.0, but bigger than the part, it's gonna make one pass. If I make it smaller, if I make it 1.0, it's gonna pass twice on my part. So it's gonna be the amount of basically step over the cutter has. So it looks at all the geometry, figures out how many steps it can do in between that with that value. Because mine value is only 1.875 and I gave it two, it's only gonna do one pass. Now, this, nine, this zero degrees is the direction, you can see with the arrows right here that it's gonna face mill. If I wanted to face mill at 45 degrees across my part, I could do that, you wouldn't probably do that, but uh, I wanna go zero degrees, just one pass right across my part. And right here, it's gonna give you a little extra space for, a, it'll extend the pass. I like to extend the pass a little bit, like 0.1, it's just me for right now. Now, if I was doing multiple depths, if I couldn't just do this in one cut, I could click multiple depths and tell it what my depth of cut would be. But right now, I don't want, I just want the depth of cut to be the full depth I set up right here in my heights. So last but not least, these are called lead-ins and lead-outs. You can't just drop a tool on the workpiece. This is a question on the, on the, in your virtual lab. If you drop a tool directly on the workpiece, it leaves what we call a dwell mark on the workpiece. It's called a dwell mark. The dwell mark is a physical mark on the workpiece where the cutter slightly removed more material from sitting there and dwelling or in it, in it, you can see it. So if you drop, if you pull up and down on your part without leading in or leading out, it leaves what we call a dwell mark. So we do lead ins and lead outs to prevent dwell marks on our parts. That's a question. So remember that. So at this point, I'm happy with the default one. So when I hit the check mark, basically it creates, oh, it created two for me there for some reason, but it creates basically that, that face pass like we see right there. 
Now, if we look at the one up here, it only created one face pass. And the reason is I picked just the inside of the part there. And, and I had to fool it a little bit just to do one pass down the center. So for some reason, it didn't like to go ahead and fully bury my part there. So let's just go ahead and let's just fix that real quick. Do that, right click, edit, comes down here, I, I pull it up. I have my menu set up to do this this way. Yours probably don't do it that way. So when I go here, I'm gonna go stock contours. We're gonna still pick that one again, check mark, and it upgraded this. So if you look, I'm, a, I'm not a big fan of, of the part you just pulling straight off of here. I like to come off the part. That's why I did that extension. So when I come here, I'm gonna go to edit, just to show you how this works. I can come back down here and I can go over here to my tangential extension. I'm gonna make it one inch just to go ahead and extend past. Boom, it makes it go a little bit longer past the part right there. So now that face one matches, if I was to generate this one, it matches that one up there pretty much. It will. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this one. Now, in order to make this make sense, I like to right click on them. I like to go to rename, I'm gonna call it face top of stock to 0.49 height. So I like to go ahead and just name them for you so it makes sense with what they're named. Now, now at that point, I have to be able to simulate this, right? I, there's two ways you can simulate this. What I can first do is I can come over here and I could go to this simulate. What that does is it brings up this little window down over here, it's called simulation. And we've got basically the speed. So when I press play, it's a little slow, I'm gonna go faster. It shows me exactly what it's doing, what position it is down here in the X and the Y and the Z to the G54, what RPM and feed rate I have. So I can kind of verify if that looks good. I'm gonna go faster. And that's what it does. So I just simulated it there on my solid model, what my cutter is going to do. Now there's this other simulation called stock simulation. That brings in the full stock. And when I press play on this one, it did it really quick, but it shows you what your material removal rate was or how much volume of material you removed. And it shows you the part, what it looks like afterwards. So there's two ways to simulate your tool paths. Now that I got that first tool path done, I've got to go ahead and create my second tool path. Now, what I'm a big fan of is I have roughing tools and finishing tools in our lab. In fact, some of those roughing tools have only been changed once since 2018. That's how, that's how conservative we run our feeds and speeds and cutting aluminum. So I use a half inch, two flute, high speed steel end mill to rough. I would remember that a half inch high speed steel two flute end mill is used to rough the, the, the contour of the part. So to rough this thing out, I'm gonna do a face or a contour pass, 2D contour. I'm going to come over here, drag this menu back up. And you're going to see that what I have here now, this 2D contour, I don't want to use a face mill for it. I'm going to hit library and I'm going to go up here to my half inch flat and hit select. At this point, it's got very conservative feeds and speeds. So um, what we've got here is we've got a 500 surface speed for the half inch two flute end mill. Remember that. And the spindle speed ends up being 3819 or 3820 basically. Now, because it's, it's a two flute and we're cutting very, very conservatively because students sometimes put parts in backward or wrong. They don't go ahead and tighten the vices all the way. Sometimes they have issues with learning how to tighten the vise. So I run a really small chip load in the lab and it's a beginner lab, right? We can't just go, out, go right out of the gates going as fast as we can on our first CNC project. So I run a really small chip load, like two thou. And it's only a two flute cutter. So it only cuts at 16 inches per minute, but this gives students a, a chance to kind of see what's happening and how it actually works. If we were an industry, we'd got a business running feeds and speeds like this. Now, when I come over here to the con, so I set my fees and speeds up, fair enough, from the, the tool. If I had to change them, I can change them right here. But I'd remember that the half inch, two flute, high speed steel end mill runs a 500 surface speed in this program. 
So when I moved back, oh, I, didn't mean, I didn't mean to hit the check mark. So I, I accidentally hit check mark, which means I'm done, but it told me, hey, you didn't pick anything yet. So this at this point, I can I need to pick the geometry I want to contour around my part. So that geometry is going to be this geometry right here. You'll see the arrows on the correct side. Or I could pick this geometry. Whoops, you want to pick the face. You could pick faces by accident. I want to pick the edge or that geometry. That's literally the same exact geometry that wouldn't make a difference on which one I pick. But because I want to show you some things on some selection stuff later on, I'm going to pick the bottom piece of it right now. So I'm going to pick the bottom. Now, the key with the contour is when I, I use an end mill to contour. Remember that end mills are used for contouring. Now, when, when we go around the outside of the part, we are going to be contouring around the outside. If I hit reverse, it would be going around the inside of that line contouring and just destroying that end mill because we've got, got a full width of cut. So you wanna make sure you pick the correct side of the line to go ahead and contour on as you, once you pick your geometry. And that's what that little arrow does right there. There's a version of HSM works that they took away the arrow, but then it came back. So hopefully you don't have that version without the arrow. Now, and it, all you gotta do is come back in and hit reverse if it goes the wrong way. Now, the next tab right over here is remember, that's all my heights. So I, I no longer have a stock top. I know only everything's at model top now, if you think about it, because I cut off all the stock. It would still work with stock top, but I'm gonna pick model top for everything. So I'm gonna go 0.1 from model top. I'm gonna go 0.1 from model top. I'm gonna 0.1 from model top. I always make these 0.1 unless I have to jump over a fixture or something that's in the way. Now my top, my cut is gonna start at the model top and it's gonna end at the contour, check that out. So if the contour is your final height, I can pick contour as the bottom or I could pick from selection right here and just pick that surface and that's the same thing. So what it's gonna do, it's gonna cut from here to here. And to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and come over here. So I'm good there. I could do that in multiple depths if I wanted to. But remember, let's start at the top here. When we're contouring on the CNC, we can contour in two directions. We've got climb and conventional milling. When I climb mill, that's my preferred direction in CNC milling. It uses less horsepower. It creates a thick to thin chip and it doesn't tend to carry the chips back onto the surface like con conventional milling does. Because our Haas CNCs are very rigid and have ball screws, they're not gonna try to run away in our cut like a manual mill might do. So really there's other reasons to conventional mill but we're going to climb mill on everything. And you'll see that's basically selected here. So we're keeping the cutter on the left side of the line of, of our part, on the left side of the part, basically. Now, I use this in computer for my cutter comp. That's what offsets the center line location of the tool pass, the radius value of the tool. Now, when I hit, if I wanted multiple finishing passes, I could click that, but because this is a roughing pass, I could do stock to leave right here and I could leave 10 thou on the walls and nothing on the floor right there. So I'm coming around to this geometry, but I'm gonna leave 10 thou on the walls of the stock to come back around and finish with my 3 8 three flute carbide end mill. So at this point here, I'm happy with these, these values. If I didn't wanna cut this all in one depth, I could hit multiple depths right here and I could give it like a 50 thou depth of cut. And I, that's a really small depth of cut. And I could, I would cut basically whatever I had in the overall height, it would divide that by 50 thou and make that many passes down. But this is not a big, this is not a lot of material to cut, especially a high, little high speed half inch two flute. So we're gonna cut it in one depth and round you go right around the part. Now over here in the linking, we wanna go ahead and have a lead in and lead out. So what this does is it adjusts the distance of the lead in and lead out arcs and lines. When I hit a check, when I hit check mark, I'm going to show you how that works. You're going to see I'm leading in and leading out off my part right here. You see that? So I don't create a dwell mark. So I right click, I go to edit. I can shorten that thing up 
by coming back over here and going from 0.1 to 0 0.025 maybe, real small value. And you're gonna see now my lead into my lead out shortened up right there. But what happens here now is we are basically right clicking, renaming it, and I'm gonna rough outside contour. If I can spell this morning. There we go. So I'm going to rough this outside contour. Now you're going to see here, I can simulate this by going to stock simulation. I'm a bigger fan of stock simulation. Bring this up. We'll go ahead and press play. Whoa, it went way too quick. Let me, let me rewind that. Let me go slower here, press play. This is exactly what the cutter is going to be doing now. So you'll see, I'm gonna close this window. It's gonna leave a little bit of stock on the outsides for that 3 8 inch end mill to come back and finish up. So let's go ahead and do that one now. So we're gonna do another contour tool path to go ahead and finish this outside edge of the part. So let's do that. Close these up, close that up, open that up. I'm gonna pick 2D milling contour. At this point, I'm gonna drag this up. You're gonna see, I no longer want tool two, the half inch flat end mill, that was my roughing end mill. I wanna go ahead and hit library. I'm gonna pick tool three, my three flute, three eighths inch flat end mill. See, it has three flutes. When I select that, this thing is actually gonna run, I'm gonna run 6,000 spindle speed with this tool. It's only a 589 surface speed. So the 3 8 flat end mill runs 6,000 RPM, which only equates to a 589 feet per minute surface speed. It's carbide, it could be running 900 to 1200, maybe even faster than that. I think the recommended is 1200 for that tool surface speed, but we're out of RPM in our spindle. We would have to go to our advanced lab and put it on our, our VF2 super speed machine, which has a 15K spindle. If we wanted to run like the true 1200, basically the 1200 surface speed right there. I could run 12,000 RPM with it. And that's commonly what we, what we do with that exact tool. We run about 12,000 RPM with it. But we're limited by our machine tool spindle at this point. So we're gonna spin at 6,000 RPM, which equals 589 surface speed. Now, I wanna go ahead and do a chip load of three thou here for finishing. We're gonna go ahead and do basically 36 inches a minute then if you look at that. Nice round numbers because we've got a nice round RPM, right? And when we ramp and plunge, I'm gonna do it at 18 just, just for, for fun, even though we're not plunging into material right now. So at this point, I'm gonna come back over here. I'm gonna prove to you that I can do the same thing just by picking the top profile. You wanna make sure that arrow's on the outside of that, that contour. I come over here to this next tab, and this next tab is my heights. So remember, I'm going all off model top now, because the stock top's gone, technically, although it'll still work. And I like 0.1 for model top, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, so those three are 0.1. I'm starting cutting at model, model top. I'm gonna stop cutting at selection, right there. That's gonna be what I'm gonna cut to finish up this part. When I come over here, I have got climb milling. I'm good there. I'm, this is my finish pass, so I'm not gonna leave any stock. So I'm making sure that's unchecked. <clears throat> and then my lead in and my lead outs are pretty good small sizes. You'll see make them really small because time is money. And we're gonna hit check mark. So what that does is it creates a tool path, the center line location data for the 3 8 inch tool path. So if I right click, I rename it, I'm gonna write finish outside contour, uh, basically three eighths inch in mill. Rename, I'm just gonna put half inch in mill. Perfect. So last but not least, in order not to cut ourselves on the part, we're going to chamfer it. And I'm using a spot drill for a chamfer tool because I use the spot drill. It's a, it's a 90 degree spot drill, which leaves a 45 degree lead angle. So remember that the spot drills lead angle for this project is 45 degrees. 
And that lead angle is going to make a 45 degree chamfer on my part. It spots holes that are 40 at 90 degrees. Now, when you're normally picking a spot drill, if you have a hard to cut material, your spot drill angle should be 120 degrees because you want the spot drill angle to be larger than the drill tips angle. And the standard drill bits angle is 118 degrees. So remember that uh, drill bits standard angle is 118 degrees. Now, when that, when we, so the spot drill, the 120 degree one will actually help it self center a lot better than the 90 degree. But because I only have a tool carousel with 10 tools, I use that 90 degree spot drill to spot holes, to locate the holes. I use it to chamfer the outside of the part and we're gonna make the wrong size countersink with it as well because we're, so we're gonna use it basically for three different operations. So what I'm getting at is I'm using a spot drill to chamfer right now. So when I pick chamfer, I bring this back up here. I'm gonna to go to my library. I'm gonna to go to my 45 degree spot drill. I'm gonna hit select. So this spot drill is high speed steel. I'm running a 450 surface speed with it. I could run 500, 600, but this one's running 450 surface speed at 16 inches per minute, which ended up being almost a 3000 chip load. So right now we're going to, so we got the tool. We want to chamfer the outside of the part, right? So you always pick the outside edge, which represents the real chamfer size. If I picked it up here, my radius would be smaller than the outside of my part radius and it would look funny. You always pick the true radii sizes of your chamfer. So I pick out there. I now have to look at it and my arrow's on the wrong side. So I'm gonna hit reverse, cool. So we've selected our geometry for our chamfer now. Now with the chamfer, I'm gonna go model top, model top, model top, model top, and model top. I'm gonna do 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. I am not gonna give it a depth right here. The chamfer tool path will automatically give it the correct depth. So I just give it the top of my part where the chamfer starts. So when I come over here now, I give it my chamfer size. And this is where I gotta refer back to my engineering drawing because I forgot it off the top of my head. So real quick, I'm gonna jump back over to the PDF of the drawings. And I look at this drawing and my chamfer is 25 thou. Does everybody see that? So now I'm going to go jump back over to, I'm going to jump back over here. So I'm going to pick the chamfer size because remember the chamfer size is the leg of the chamfer. So 025. I'm only going to have a drop down 25 thou away from the tool. It's going to, or it's going to use the tool's geometry to figure that out. And then I'm going to keep it away from the wall about 50 thou. So that sets up my chamfer, the 25 thou chamfer right there. And this just offsets my tool a certain amount away from it. You don't want it too close to the center line of the tool because you'll see it on the, on the chamfer. Then last but not least, I go to my linking over here and make sure that my lead in lead out looks good. I'm happy with that. So I hit check mark. And what it does is it brings the chamfer tool around the part like you see right here. So let's go ahead. I'm going to right click, rename. I'm going to write chamfer outside diameter, outside contour. I'm going to write five eight inch SD spot drill. So we now have a fully written CNC program. So what I do is I want to make sure it makes my model correctly. So I go to stock simulate. I go to play, or I bring this up. I go to play. It cuts the part. If I didn't want to see the tools, I can click off of them and it just starts making the, it, it just starts disappearing material. So I like to look at the tool. Then we got our chamfer. And our part looks good. It gives us the statistics on our tool. So zooming in, you don't see your solid model really, but it is behind the scenes right there. It matches. So I would feel comfortable as long as my feeds and speeds are good running this part or making this code.
Now, to make the code, it's a post processor. So I've got to post process the code. And to do that, I simply click on the entire setup right here. So I click on that entire setup. I hit post process. What's really nice about Autodesk is they provide all of their post processors for all their machines to everybody available on the internet free. So I'm able, if I needed one for a new machine or project, I could go out there without having to contact any other vendors or anybody and get that post instantly and be running. That's a big advantage instead of having to contact somebody at another CAM software company and looking for a post. So let me show you how that works. I can open these posts. Basically, I don't want to open the configuration, but I can open the post real quick files and you'll see I've got all the different manufacturers of machine tools. So I've got Fanuc, I've got Fidel, I've got Bridgeport, I've got Haas, Heidenheim, Herco, Mazak, it's pretty much all the popular ones. If you've got a Roland, they got Roland mills, so forth, and so forth, Siemens. So I pick the type of machine tool that I'm gonna be cutting on. So I, we're using Haas machines. So we're gonna pick a Haas one right here. And I'm gonna end up picking basically the pre next gen control pre-NGC, even though we have next-gen controls, this works fine for what we're doing. Now, so that's going to basically format all the GNM code that we put into the machine in the Haas format. There's slight little differences between machine tool manufacturers when it comes to program format. And that's the purpose of the post-processor is to format it correctly for your brand of machine tool. Now, when, when we have G1, G2, G3, and so forth, linear interpolation, circular interpolation. We're going to learn all about that in lecture at some point throughout the quarter here. When we, when we have those codes, they're the same, whether it's a Fidel or a Herco or Haas. It's just the way the, the, the code is formatted, like G54 work coordinate system might not be the same in a, in a Fidel. And they might use an E1 or an E2 for like a fixture offset and so forth. So there, those slight differences are taken care of through that post processor. And that's really the third component of CAD CAM programming. Because if you remember from the PowerPoint at the beginning today, CAD is the first component of CAD CAM programming. CAM is the second component. Then the post processor is actually what makes all the code happen. That's, the, that's our third component. So looking at this post processor here, it grabbed our program name or number from our job setup. And then it grabbed our program comment from that job setup. And when I go ahead and I press post, what it's going to do, it's going to ask me, where do you want to save the G code? I'm going to throw it on my desktop for right now. So when I hit save, you're going to see it, my, it pops up on my desktop. So I want to make sure everybody's seeing the same thing. Yep. So, and then it's got my five digit number with an O in front of it. That's how Haas formats their, their program numbers. It's got a little, anything in parentheses is a comment. So it's got that. And you'll notice it's got comments on each one of my tool paths. So this is the alphanumeric data that's gonna drive that tool. For example, the face mill is tool number 10 and M6 has it change tools. So remember M6 is a tool change. So M6, you might need to know that. Then, we turn on our spindle to 2865 M3. So M3 is the M code that basically turns on the spindle clockwise. G54 is our work coordinate system that we set up. That's our XYZ0 that we set up. I'm going to show you how we set up G54s in a minute here on, uh, on the video. So there's G54. There is the X, the Y position. It wraps to the starting point and calls up the height offset for the tool. This one, because it's, it's built for a care, it's built for a, a side mount tool changer, it calls up tool two, that it's just gonna skip that in the code if it, if it can't call it up, it's not a big deal. But after that, it pretty much gets into its cutting. So really it starts at an X of 5.35 and it cuts to an X of negative 0.95. So that's where it starts, X of, of positive 5.35 and ends at X and negative 9.5 after it comes across the part. So that's really what's going on right there. Then it switches tools to the next tool and starts roughing the outside contour. So it generated all this G code that you see right here by creating tool paths with HSM works in SolidWorks right there. So I'm gonna close that one. 
So that's op CNC operation number one. That's how we took, we went from raw stock, we qualified the A datum surface now, and we then machined the, the other datums. They're not called out on here, but B and C are the secondary and tertiary datums are machined. So I can put it in the vise now and locate it for the second CNC operation. So that second CNC operation, if I jump over to my configurations, I mean, right click and show the second CNC configuration. So the part gets flipped over now, like you see there, and placed on its A datum in the vise. In fact, let me show you the setup sheet for this. So there's op one, by the way, set up. Op two is right here. So we flip over the part, we hold it in the same work holding as op one, same XYZ zero. It's the same XYZ zero on the machine. We have to change that to reflect where that is in the CAD system here. We're gonna do that here in a second. But we're gonna locate on those machine datums, right? So the A datum locates three, three, three points on that surface. The B or the secondary datum butts up against the jaw right down here. So that jaw right here is fixed. Remember this moves back and forth, this back jaw. And then this little pin right here is our stop that locates where the X axis zero is. So that's gonna fully locate all of our machined op one blanks in there. And we have to do quite a few more tool paths in order to make this part here. So when we do these tool paths, let me go ahead and clear this. We have to look at our drawing we have to go ahead and face it down to the appropriate length, right? So we're at 0.49 relatively. We got to get it down to 0.48. So we got to do a face mill pass. Then we have a bunch of extra material. If I go back to SolidWorks, a bunch of extra material on this outside top that we held onto it in the vise before. We need to use some sort of adaptive clearing to clear out that all that material. And I'll show you that. So we'll adaptive clear. Then we'll come back and we'll contour this outside profile. And we'll get that all, we'll get that all nice and contoured. And at that point, so once we contour it, we're then going to basically pocket this floor, right? Or pocket this right here, rough that floor out. We'll then cut the slot right here and then we'll do the whole processes. I like to do all my milling operations when possible first, then I do all my whole processes second usually. So that's what we're gonna end up doing. I'm not gonna be able to go, I, with the interest of time and the other stuff we gotta do today in our virtual lab, I'm not gonna be able to go through step-by-step step through every single toolpath, but I'm gonna show you how the toolpaths were created for the ones that we haven't touched yet or we haven't tried yet here in this video. So let me just generate everything on this new setup real quick to show you that how it's all working. So, what I did first is I went and I created a brand new job. Instead of creating a new job like I did in my demo down here for op one, I'm gonna right click and edit this one just to show you some things. So with this, with this new job, I showed it basically my part, which was my made part that I brought in here, the mill project one part. Let me, let me actually clear all of my selections. So my main part is gonna be right there in blue now. My stock is actually my op one part right there. Boom, there it is in green and pink. See that? So that's what we cut in op one. Op two sits in there just like so. Now, my work coordinate system had to change a little bit. And I want to talk about this. So I'm going to hit check mark real quick. I had to have a work coordinate system out here in space, if you think about it, because my this edge, well, the bottom surface right here is my my A datum, my Z zero, right? Then this surface right here is my Y zero. This surface right here is my X zero. So I didn't have a point on my model or my part where I could go ahead and put a coordinate system. So what I did real quick is I drew a sketch and I put a point out there in space where it needed to be. I then went to assembly features and I inserted a coordinate system right here that had the appropriate X, Y, and Z lined up. What I did instead of pressing the green check mark, I'll just go into this one right here and edit. It lined up the X, Y, and Z right there. And I named that coordinate system 
op two G54 home location. So when I go back over here into my, into my operation number two part and my job setup, if I go to edit, you're going to see here that the job now has this coordinate system selected. So I literally selected this coordinate system I built. Let me come over here. I selected the coordinate system that I built out there to reflect where the X, Y, Z, zero is on this part in second, the second operation. So you got to make it match. The machine's got to match the cam system or else you won't make good parts, promise you. Now, moving down, this is going to be program number two, technically, for us today. And it's going to be MP1 op two. So it's going to be mill project number one op number two. So when I hit check mark there, it creates my stock in yellow and then my part in gray. And the first thing I did was I just face milled the part. You've seen this before. I just picked the outside surface of the part. I picked the same face mill, same feeds and speeds that we talked about. And I pretty much when I hit check mark, it face mills it down to the 0.48 height. Now this next one that I'm gonna show you is this 2D adaptive clearing tool path. When I pick that one, 2D adaptive clearing, I give it the stock bound, let me go over here. I, I'm using, remember roughing, I'm using tool two. So I'm using this half inch flat end mill to rough the part, all that material that's between the orange and the blue lines right there. So in this setup right here, I give it basically the edge right here of my part. So I gave it, if you look, the, the overall, overall profile of my part right there, that edge. So I don't wanna cut past into that, but I do wanna cut in between the orange where my stock contour is and that blue piece. Now, with my heights, stock top, stock top, I start at stock top because now I have stock at the top. So I got model top here. Now I'm gonna go down to contour. I'm gonna go down just to this machine surface right here, right? Where, where, where I cut out before. So those are my heights. My step over, I'm stepping over now an eighth of an inch in between passes. And I'm gonna leave 15 thou on the walls and five thou on the floor of the part. So when I hit check mark, it figures out where it needs to cut with that end mill. It drops in outside the part. Let's let's actually watch it. Let's actually watch it do this. So we're gonna go to we're gonna go look at these two tool paths right here by stock simulating just those two. So when I press play. It does that, and then it starts on the outside. It works its way around, cutting off all that material. So it does that, and it's going to come back around. It's leaving 15 thou on the edges, and then it works itself back here. It rapids back over, repositions, and takes out that little bit of material right there. That's what adaptive does. It's a really cool tool path. Now, when I hit check mark, so that cleared out my overall, I got the right height and I got the overall profile cleared out there. While this is out, I might as well rough my pocket. So right click and it, it's another adaptive tool path. Basically on this, this adaptive tool path, the difference is, I, same tool, I gave it the inside profile and I clicked on this machine cavities. So it's going to stay inside my blue profile this time. Now, the heights, if you look at the heights are on model top, model top. I start at model top and I stop at the contour down here. When I go over here to my cut control, I'm only roughing this pocket. So I'm going to leave 0.015 of stock on the walls and the floor of the part. I'm climb milling, stepping over an eighth of an inch. Now, on the linking parameters, Whenever you cut or plunge into a pocket, you like to do a helix. Remember this, the most common way to enter into a pocket it's to, pr to promote tool life is a helix. Remember that. You do helical plunge moves into a pocket. So you're gonna see, I picked a helical ramp at two degrees. So it's gonna do a corkscrew down in, 
to the depth and then take off. That's called the helical plunge. So when I hit check mark, you're gonna see it does this little green helix down in at the, at the plunge feed rate and it works its way out and opens up that pocket right there. So to kind of look at the part, we're gonna simulate it real quick. We're gonna come in here. I'm gonna highlight just the first three tool paths by holding down shift. And at this point I hit simulate. And when I go to press play, bring this up. You can see my face mill goes ahead, cuts the part. I'm gonna go a little faster. Right there, then it comes around the part like this. Show it to you without, without the... Does a little rapid move and then Helix is down and it cuts the profile out of the part right there. So that's what we got so far. We'll do stock simulation in a, in a minute or two. Now, to finish the, the finish the outside floor right here, I, want, I basically wanted to go ahead and finish this part, this, this outside edge right there. To do that, all I did is I picked my finishing tool, which is a 3 8 inch end mill. So you're gonna see we have this 3 8 inch end mill, 6,000 RPM, 3,000. And I only picked this time, instead of picking the entire round around the part, I only picked this piece of the part. So I took this button called tangent propagation off and propagate along Z when I was selecting. What that does is it allows me just to select, it allows me just to select the, whoops, the pieces that I wanna cut right there. Now my depths of cut start at the top in right there. You've seen that before. My step over is gonna be 150 thou. So that's my width of cut, my depth, of or my so that's my and then I'm going to do roughing passes. So if I do three roughing passes, it's going to do th it's going to basically space three passes in at 115 thou until I get to my final pass right there. And I'm leaving 25 thou on the walls in there to finish the contour in the next tool path. So when I press check mark, it starts out here and it basically does those three roughing passes and then the fourth finishing pass right there. That's how I cleared out all that material. Now, the next profile right here cuts around the part. It's gonna finish the part using the 3 8 inch end mill. I'm not gonna show that one. It's, it's really, actually, it's literally just this profile right here around the outside of the part to the bottom depth right there. So, and you know how the feeds and speeds work. Then I finished the floor as a pocket. So I picked this 2D, pocket tool path and I just pocketed the floor which finishes the walls and the floor of the part right there. So I did a little helix down and pretty much went through and cut that out. I then fin well, I, I finished the walls too right there. And then in order to cut the slot with the ball end mill, this is a little bit different. It was a contour. So does everybody see this line right here? I went out in my assembly environment and I drew a sketch for the ball in mills path. There it is right there, space bar normal two. So I drew a sketch right down the center of that radius and I exit that sketch in SolidWorks. So I have a line now to follow instead of geometry, a sketch line. And when I'm over here, I went to contour the fillet slot. So this time my tool ended up being a ball end mill. So it's a quarter inch ball end mill. And my profile was my contour line right here, right? So I drew a sketch line for the ball end mill. Remember that the ball end mill's geometry for the cam system was a sketched line, not the solid model. Now, when we go over here to the depths, the depth comes right down to the bottom of this pocket for the tip of the tool, right? So that's the bottom depth of it. Now to keep the tool from going to the right or the left of the line, I turned off cutter compensation. So I turned that off so it follows on top of the lines. And I gave it, because it's a full width cut with this end mill, with the ball end mill, I gave it basically 50 thou depths of cut and one 10 thou finish pass right here. 
So what that does when I hit check mark is it comes in and it follows on that line. It does its 250 thou depths of cut. Then it basically finishes up the last finish pass there. That's a 10 thou. So it did 50, whatever's left, and then the 10 thou finish. So that's how we got that radius in the part. Now to do spot drills or to spot the holes, it's a drilling operation. So I literally drilled the part, or I literally picked a spot drill, hooked up the feeds and speeds and showed it the holes. So I, all I really got to do is clear selection. I show it the hole and it finds the center for where it's going to spot drill. Now the depths for the drill are right here. So I went 100 thou down with the spot drill and I just drill straight in, it's a can cycle. So drilling cycles, remember this one too, drilling cycles on the Haas CNC machine are can cycles. So whenever we have repetitive Z moves, we use a can cycle. So drilling is performed in a can cycle, remember that. So when I hit check mark, we have our spot drill right there that spots the holes. So if we wanted to look at the part so far, all the way up to that point, we go up to the spot the holes. We're gonna stock simulate it. We're gonna press play. We're gonna let it go really fast. We're gonna press play. We're gonna go a little bit faster than that. So this is what our part is looking like so far. It's very colorful, but we've got, we've got pretty much most things machined away and we're ready to we're ready to pretty much drill our holes and go for it. So looking at this, my next tool, I just spotted that hole. It was a different height, so I went ahead and made it a different tool path. So I'm gonna generate that tool path real quick. I then used what we call a contour tool path to engrave. So I simply picked, instead of engrave, I picked 2D contour. I'm a little old school the way I do this. And I go to edit. And with my engraving, I use a 16th inch ball end mill, really small ball end mill. In fact, I don't think I've ever changed the engraving tools out in two years. So they're gonna run 6,000 RPM, which ends up only being a 98 surface speed. We're gonna round off on all the answers on, this, on, the, on the, the lab assignment. So we're running a 98 surface speed with a 16th inch ball at 6,000 RPM. So that equates to 6,000 RPM with a 16th inch diameter. And we're going to run a feed rate of 24 inches per minute with that tool right there. So that's how that's what we're doing for the engraving. And on the engraving, all I did was I picked my lines right there for my for my text. So I picked all the lines of my text. I'm not going to sit there and do it with you right here. And what I did is my engraving is going only two thou down from this top face from the top face of where the part is. And I turn off cutter comp. So it just follows on the line. So when I hit check mark, it follows on top of the lines, two thou down, and it leaves that really nice little logo. So at this point, tool seven is a regular drill, or is a is a tap drill. It's a tool seven is the is basically the tapped hole. This is the through hole right here for the two hundred thou diameter, two hundred one diameter hole. This is the through holes for the letter F drill. And then this is the blind hole for the drill. So really, in order to do the drilling holes, you pick drilling up here at the top. It's a very simple tool path. You pick your drill with your feet and speed for it. So the drill tool number eight runs a 250 surface speed at 19 inches per minute. So the chip load for drills are specified in feed per revolution. Remember that one too. Chip load for drills are feed per revolution, not feed per tooth on the mill. So it's got a 5,000 feed per revolution. Now I picked the hole I wanted to drill. I picked the depth right here. So the top of the hole is the model top. The bottom of the hole is the selection. I went down and picked the bottom of the hole down there, right there, that point. And it knows how deep to go. And what I do is I like to pet drill. So we are pet drilling at 50 thou increments for these holes right here. We're going real light on the drill. If I was an in industry, I'd probably, in aluminum, I'd probably just straight drill. But uh, eighth inch packs, a little bit, little bit more than that. We're pecking 50 thou in for our drilling there. So when I hit check mark, it's gonna go ahead and drill the hole. I 
tap the hole. Tapping is performed through what we call a G84 can cycle. So remember, tapping uses a, what we call G84 can cycle. It's nothing more than a drilling tool path. And in that drilling tool path, my tool becomes a tap instead of, uh, instead of a, a drill. So I pick a tap right here. I give it the RPM and, the, and it figures out the feed rate automatically because the feed rate is nothing more than the RPM times the pitch. I give it the hole here that I'm gonna tap and then the depth that I wanna go ahead and come down to. I wanna go all the way through my part with that tap. Now here it's a tapping cycle. So that's what gives me this, if you look right here on the screen, it's a G84 tapping cycle. You see right there, that's gonna be a, a, a question. So remember G84 is how we, the can cycle for tapping. Now that leads me to pretty much just finishing up my part with a little bore. So I counter board my hole with this tool path called bore. Ooh. So I pick bore, it's pretty cool. You pick bore and you pick your end mill that you wanna bore with. I'm boring with my 3 8 inch end mill. The bore, you pick the whole face of the bore and it figures out the depth based off the face of the bore. So I really didn't have to give it whole top or bottom here. It knows that value. I can adjust it more or less than that. And then I bore basically with a 25 thou step over. So you're in, in you can see then it'll, it'll basically bore that hole. Like you see right there, make a counter bore. I then pull out my tool five, which is a chamfer tool, right? So I basically go around and chamfer the part. We've already done chamfers. I chamfer the holes by simply drilling them. I had to do them all individually because I wanted to make, they're all at slightly different depths to get a chamfer on the top of those things. So that basically leads me to my entire, whoops, my entire part has been programmed. So you gotta just think about what do I need to do to this raw material to bring it from a block of stock, if it's, if it's basically bar stock, to a finished part like you see right here. So you have to have a general knowledge of what the tools do. And that's why we learned about how, what, how all the tools work or what the different types of tools are. You've got to have a knowledge of surface speed, right? And chip loads of what you're going to be able to run with these different types of parts and depths of cut and step over. So that takes a little bit of time and making a bunch of parts, learning how much depth of cut and step over you can do. And then you got to just kind of have an, a good idea of how you're going to hold on to things in the work, how you're going to, what your work holding is going to be like, where your work coordinate systems are going to be located and so forth. But when you're all done programming like this, you're going to go ahead. I'm going to hit save just in case. You never know. It warned me it hasn't been saved in at least 20 minutes. So you should definitely do that. But we go to simulate right here, right? And then I can simulate it over the whole part if I wanted to. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go to stock simulation, which brings out the, the entire stock. And we're going to bring this up. We're going to slow it down a little bit at first. Press play. Oh, that was kind of fast. But you're going to see I have my overall whole part done right here, right? <laughs> you can see it engraved it and did it and, and so forth. So we've ran over like 3,000 of these parts in the past two years. So. We're up at about 2,800 parts, or, uh, probably around 2,800 parts because we do about seven or 800 a year. So um, what were seven to 800 depending, and plus we had some summer school. But um, what you'll see here, that's the process of, of doing it. And really I've never explained the CAD CAM programming to this class. This is kind of an extra thing for the virtual, the virtual lab assignment. Since some of you missed your face-to-face -face labs, you're making this up for your face-to-face -face participation. Some of you weren't able to make it to campus this quarter. So this is our virtual lab experience. And I'm teaching you the engineering behind the machining that we, that we were doing in lab here. So with that all said and done here, when I go to post-process this second operation, I pick my same Haas mill post-processor. It's program number two, mill project one, op number two. So when I hit post, uh, I'm gonna just save it on the desktop real quick because that's where we saved the last one. I hit save. It brings up my code. So now I have tools two through 10. So I've got nine tools on this thing, right? So that, I, that I'm using here. And so it's a nine tool setup. If you look, it's making all the code. Look how much code we made by the press of a button. Or what are we at? 
2,600 lines of code to make that part, to make the second op of that part. So it goes through, it's just all the, the data to do that. So if you'll see, we got T10 M6, it's changing the tool, it's basically going through and, and cutting the part. We're gonna learn a little bit more about G-code in a lecture later on in the quarter. Um, 145 students, I think you learn it in 146 a little bit more so, and we, we do it, you're not gonna learn it this quarter, but you will learn it next quarter coming to class. So um, yours, yours is split up into two quarters. So what we have here is that's the end of the CAD CAM portion of this assignment here. So let me go now over to right here. So we have our drawing. That was the first step, right, of CAD CAM programming is having an engineering drawing or a model with model-based definitions so I know all my tolerances, so I can make good decisions on my tool paths and my tooling that I'm gonna use for this part. Now, now that I have my CNC programs written, it's time for me to go ahead and write what we call a setup sheet. So I've got to document how to set up the, the CNC program I just wrote. So what a setup sheet does is it gives me information like the machine tool we're going to be using, uh, the, the part name, the drawing that we're using, the, the raw material size, and it's going to tell me how to go ahead and set up this part, like install the chick vice, soft jaw set, and use an indicator to make sure it's square. You load CNC program number two. I saved it as one, by the way, but you're gonna load CNC program number two. I forgot one is the warm-up program, but uh, we're, not, we're not putting these in, it's virtual today. So it's program number two, MP1 op one into the Haas control. So that's the program you would load. You make sure the height offsets are touched to the six inch tool gauge line. We're gonna show you that here in a second. You're gonna set the Z zero height on the bottom surface of the soft jaw. You're gonna set the X, Y zeros on the basically the right bottom right edge of the part right here. You deburr your saw cut edges with a file. You load your workpiece against the datum targets in the soft jaw. So you push it against the bottom surface, you blow out the vise first, you'll push it up against there and you tighten the vise and you torque it to 25 foot pounds of torque with the torque wrench. You'll then run your CNC program. You'll pay a close attention to the information in the manuals, this one's written for you. And then yeah, basically unclamp it and inspect it and make sure it's good. So that's really how to set it up. And a lot of times on the setup sheet, you're going to have a picture of the setup so the operator knows where the work coordinate system is, how the setup should look when they go install the jaws and put the, the raw work piece or the raw material in there. They'll have a tooling information section too with what type of tooling they need. A vice is a piece of tooling. Anything that, anything that goes inside that CNC machine is a piece of tooling. So we got to go ahead and grab our soft jaw set and our milling vise. We got to grab our three tools for this operation. Ooh, we got to grab our four tools for this operation. We got to have a dial caliper and maybe a file. So everything I needed for this operation is listed right here. So I can take this sheet, grab the, it's basically the recipe to set up that one single operation in detail. Whereas the routing, the part routing is the recipe to go ahead and make the entire part from start to finish. So that's my setup sheet for, for this op number one. The op two setup sheet, I know I showed it to you as well, uses the same work holding. And what we have here is we have, so we have more tools, right? But it explains how to go ahead and set it up. Make sure that how much is going to be sticking above the jaws so we don't go ahead and machine the jaws and so forth. So those are setup sheets. Now, you usually do those offline before you even come to the machine. You've got to get the picture on the machine. But uh, then it's time to start setting up the actual machine. So what I thought I would do is we're going to go through on how to power it up, how, to, how the modes work. And then how to basically set up the part. And we're going to run mill project one, op one and op two that we just programmed. So it's literally the, the it's the literally just what we programmed right there. That exact same CAM program that I showed you in SOLIDWORKS is are these programs running on the machines? Other than the one I just wrote with you in class, we're not running that one. We're running the two that you saw that were already there. So let's start up here with the first thing you've got to do is you've got to go ahead and program your mill. So or basically, once you program your mill, you got to go start up the mill, right? You got to go turn it on. So we're at the point that we come into lab now and we, are, we have our program written. We're ready to set up the machine. So let's go. Here we go. Hi, welcome to IME 143 and 144, Haas Mill. 
we're going to go ahead and show you how to first power up this Haas mill. First, we're going to press power on. Once you press power on, the machine tool goes through a diagnostics check, where it checks all the inputs and the outputs and makes sure everything's talking to itself before allowing you to power up the machine. Once the machine has ran through its diagnostics check, it's ready to have you cycle the door, pull the emergency stop, and press power up. Once you press power up, power has gone to the servos and it's ready for you to A, press cycle start to run a program, or B, press handle jog in order to move the machine around and set up the machine. When I ask you what we're first gonna be doing, we're gonna first be pressing handle jog. So when I ask you in the thing, we're gonna press handle jog to go set up the machine now. So I'm gonna ask you that in, in the online, on the online assignment that we're doing. So we go to handle jog now, but the modes, handle jog is a mode. I'd like to go ahead and explain the six different modes the Haas machine actually has here. In this video, I'm gonna talk about the different modes a Haas CNC machine has. Every Haas machine since 1988 has six different modes. You can see right here we have edit, memory, MDI, handle jog, zero return, and list program. You can only be in one mode at a time. Well, the first mode, edit, allows you to edit your program. The second mode, memory, allows you to run the program that is currently in memory. The third mode, MDI, stands for manual data input. MDI is used heavily in setup. It allows us to call up a tool, maybe turn on the spindle, and do simple G-code commands with the control. The fourth mode, handle jog, allows us to move the axes around. So both MDI and handle jog are used to set up the mill. Then zero return allows us to zero out timers, axes, and so forth. This one isn't going to be used as much while just running the mill or setting it up. Now, last but not least, our sixth mode is list program. When we hit list program, we have a list of all the programs that are in the controls memory. However, only one program can be active in the memory at all times. And that's the one we would run through the memory program here. Now, edit mode, with an edit, if I hit that, I'm a, I can easily go through my program and make simple edits on the control. Once I hit memory again, it saves those edits, and now I have my program edited. So we run our program in memory mode. So in order to run a program, we hit memory, reset, so we're at the top of the program, and then our favorite green button right here, cycle start. All right, so those are the six modes that every Haas machine has. Now, when we are ready to go ahead and set up our program, there's two things we gotta do. We've gotta tell the machine where the bottom of the tool is the tool height offsets. And the way I, and then the second thing we got to explain is where the work coordinate system is located. We're going to first talk about tool height offsets. Because I have jaws that basically go in and out and we swap jaws and setups and fixturing in this machine, I basically set all the tool height offsets on one six inch gauge line. So if I was to ask you, where are all the tool height offsets set up in the mini mills in our material removal lab, they're set up six inches from the, from the table, six inches above the table. So to do that, I use two one, two, three blocks. One, two, three blocks are precision ground blocks that are exactly one inch, two inch, and three inch. So I stack up two three inch tall one, two, three blocks to act as a six inch gauge line. And I set all my tools up off that. That way I can use the tools for every single different program and not have to set a different height offset for every program I bring into the control. And I adjust the, the where their Z needs to go using the work coordinate system. So this is going to show you how you set up a tool height offset off the six inch gauge line on the CNC mill. I'm going to explain how we set tool height offsets on our Haas mills in the IME freshman manufacturing. All of our tools are set up off of a six inch datum or gauge height off the table surface. In order to accomplish that six inch datum, we use two three, two, one blocks. The first step is to call up the tool that you're going to be using in order to set your tool height. To do that, we go to the manual data input mode, 
and we type in the tool number we wish to touch off, such as T2. Now in order for it to switch the tool, I have to press the ATC forward button, which stands for automatic tool change. Once the tool is in the spindle, we now need to go to the handle jog mode. Handle jog allows me to move the axes using the handle jog spindle right here. Notice in the handle jog row, we have four different increments we can jog. I can go 0.1 of an inch, 0.01 of an inch, 0.001 of an inch, or 1 ten thousandth of an inch. You won't even see it move. Now, I'm going to get close with my ten thousandths per step. So I move the x-axis to position it. I move my y-axis. I'm going to open my door and drop the z-axis down slightly lower than six inch long. It's important to set our tool heights jogging upward so we don't accidentally jog down into the table or the workpiece. So what I like to do is set my tool lower than my six inch gauge block. I end up placing the lower block directly over the center line of the tool and I raise the tool up until I can slide the upper block underneath the bottom of the tool. So I double check that I'm in the Z increments. I'm going to move up in one thousandth of an inch and I slowly start to raise the spindle as I try to slide the block underneath the tool. Once it slides underneath, I slide it back out, I go down, and I double check that that was the correct height. At this point, I need to access the tool offsets page in the display section on the middle. When I hit offsets, the tools become active. I then highlight the tool number for the length that I'd like to set and press Tool Offset Measure. So you go through and you do that for all nine or all nine tools that are in there. So they all have that, they all know that their they're, they're zero point or the bottom of the tool is at a six inch point above the table. Now I've got to take the difference between that six inch point on the table and wherever the part sits in the vise or on the fixture and put that into the Z value of the WCS. That's why I shift all the tools heights location. So also I've got to tell it where the X, Y zero is in the WCS. So I got to give it X, Y and Z point when setting the WCS right here. And here's the, the video explaining it. In this segment, I'm going to explain how we set the work coordinate system on the Haas mill. To do that, we're going to use a tool called an edge finder. The edge finder is stored in tool number 10 on all of our Haas mills in the IME labs. So, we're going to close the door. We're going to go to manual data input. We ended up putting it in tool number one right after this video was written because tool number one is usually what gets loaded first thing and we put the face mill in tool number 10. And then we just leave the edge finders in tool number one, or we don't actually put them in unless we need them. So we always have tool number one as a blank, just so you know. Mode. We're going to type in tool 10 by going T10. To call that up, we press ATC forward. That brings the edge finder into the spindle. Before we use the edge finder, though, we have to take protrusion on the bottom of the edge finder and kick it out of concentricity. So that way when I start the spindle, it'll be wobbling. In order to start the spindle, we have to go to the manual data input mode and make sure we type in the correct G code in order to start the spindle. It's actually an M code. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go S1500 space M3 for spin along clockwise. Don't forget you're in the block. Once I insert that code into MDI, I simply hit cycle start and the spindle starts rotating. Now I have to move the spindle and the table. So to do that, I'm going to hit handle jog mode. And I'm going to move the edge finder over to the edge of the axis I wish to set. So 
I'm moving all the axes to get it in, in place. You just press X, Y, or Z, whichever one you want to move. Bring the small protrusion below the surface you wish to find the edge of, and then move the axes over until it gets very close to touching the surface. At that point, go to the smaller jog increment, like one thou, and slowly jog the edge finder into the edge that you wish to find. When the lower portion of the edge finder becomes concentric with the upper portion, you know you're very close. I like to go a little bit farther and make them eccentric and then come back to concentric. At this point, I know I am a hundred thou away from the edge of my part. So to store this information in the control, I a standard edge finder's diameter is 0.2. Remember that? So we're 100 thou away from the edge because the diameter is 0.2, we're the radius value away. Go to the display. I move over to the work offsets. I look at my setup sheet and I find the appropriate G54 through 59 to put the work coordinate into. On this operation, I'm going to use G57. So I highlight X axis in G57 and I press the Part zero set button. Well, wait a minute, that's not it, because we don't have the center of the spindle over the edge of the part yet. If you're good at math, you can press point one enter, and that goes ahead and adds a hundred thou in that direction. Have a nice day. I know some people that when they're setting their when they're setting up their edge finder. They don't trust just doing the math, 0.1 positive or negative and so forth. So they actually jog it up in the Z and move it over 100,000 over the center. Then they press part zero set again. But now that we've set up all of the tools, the X, Y's, I set the Z to the Z height of where, where, that, where the bottom of the part sits based off the relationship of that six inch gauge line. I also set that in the G54. We're pretty much ready to start cutting mill project one on the machine. So here we go. In this segment, I'm going to show you how to load Mill Project 1's operation number one into the milling vise. First, we have to go ahead and deburr the edges of the workpiece using our file. Files work in one direction. File the edge. Double check that no burrs are sticking up off the soft cut edge. When you're done filing, we're going to load the workpiece into the vise and make sure that the saw cut edge is stuck against the stock on the left hand side. Tighten the vise and use the dead load hammer to tap it down once and seat the stock on the bottom of the vise. So we use the dead blow hammer because when you start to tighten the vise, sometimes it pushes the stock up a little bit and you want to just give it a nice snug tap down with that dead blow hammer. the door and press the green button. There's our face mill pass. Now we're getting that two flute half inch in mill. That's coming around, roughing the outside, right? We talked about that. Then we've got the finishing tool, the three, the three eighths finishing tool. As before, we had three flute carbide. That's a two flute. Then we got our Hot drill to go ahead and chamfer. There it is. Now we're going to flip it over and locate on the. In CNC operation number two, we're going to locate our part on the machine surfaces. So we're going to use the bottom surface as the primary datum, the back edge, or kind of the front edge, as a secondary datum, and then the pin as the tertiary datum stop. So in order to load it, we place our workpiece on the machine edge into the soft jaw and slide it against the stop while fastening the vise with the vise handle. Next, we're going to give it one tap with a dead blow hammer. Double check that it's in the vise. Close the door and make sure that CNC operation number two is the active program in the memory.
So it's roughing with that adaptive clearing around the outside with that half inch, clearing away all the stock we held onto it before. Fifth, right? So there it's roughing that little flat. Now it's pocketing with the helix. Remember, we want to helix into pockets when we're plunging. And once it's done roughing that part right there, it switches tools to the three eighths. The three eighths is finishing that up in the floor right there, finishing around the outside profile of the part. Now it's finishing the pocket of the part, the floor, and then the contour of the pocket is the contour. Now we've got the ball end mill cutting the radius in the part. Spot drill, we're spot drilled the whole thing. We're engraving, that's engraving the Cal Poly logo and manufacturing engineering, best major ever. Then we're peck drilling. So we're pecking, remember we pecked at that 50 thou. We rigid tapped right there. We countersunk and then we're chamfering the part. So literally this part was sped up quite a bit. I think it's like a 10 minute part, maybe 50, it might be 12 minute part. And we have our part. Now it's time to go on to inspect it to see how well we did with that, that, that CNC operation. So once you've done all that work, you can, basically, you can basically take the part out and inspect it, do a first article inspection to see if the manufacturing process that you set up, it makes a part to the required design specs. That's what it's all about is manufacturing something to the design specs, the engineers that, that designed it came up with. You may be the engineer that designed it and manufacture it, or you might just be the design engineer or the manufacturing engineer. But nevertheless, it's good to know how machining works. It's gonna make you a better designer. And it's gonna make you be able to get your products quicker to market. So you don't have to go back and do all these design revisions along the way because you made something that wasn't manufacturable. So hopefully you've enjoyed our second or our first virtual CAD CAM programming lab for Mill Project One. I also have a virtual program, or I also have a virtual lab for our lathe project one. And then we'll have one for the screwdriver body and the screwdriver cap. When we're starting to design, we're gonna do helical thread milling and some really cool things with that screwdriver assembly. So join me for the rest of our, for our four, four virtual lab series here for the material removal labs. And have a great day. Stop by my office hours if you have any questions.